Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us during the Lithum Partners Fall 2023 Investor Conference. My name is Ben Chamsey and Vice President at Lithum Partners. During this fireside chat, we welcome Delcat Systems, ticker symbol DCTH on the NASDAQ, and their CEO, Gerard Michel. We will dive into questions in a moment, but one final item. I want to remind everyone that Gerard is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings today. If you have not already signed up, please send me an email at shamsian at lithumpartners.com. That's S-H-A-M-S-I-A-N at lithumpartners.com or visit lithumpartners.com backslash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. A quick introduction on the company. Delcath is an interventional oncology company focused on the treatment of primary and metastatic cancers of the liver. The, the company's primary product, the Hepsado kit, was recently approved for use in the United States by the FDA, and the company expects initial sales by the end of 2023. With that said, let's begin. Gerard, good afternoon. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be I here. To, oh, thank you. Um, I want to start with just providing a little bit of a background on yourself for those uh, new to the name. Sure. Um, I joined Delcath uh, three years ago. Um, I came here from uh, Vericell, a cell therapy company, um, where I was CFO and head of corporate development. Um, I had similar roles prior to that at, uh, at BioDell as well as NPS uh, Pharmaceuticals. Prior to that, uh, seven years at Booz Allen, uh, doing management consulting. Prior to that, Big Pharma, um, everything from product management to uh, work, you know, helping manage uh, the European business. Um, have a graduate degree in microbiology, uh, but uh, never really used that uh, in the industry. Got it, all right. For those new to the story, can you take a step back and speak about what Delcat's trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis liver cancer? Um, what is the landscape in terms of the TAM and the current treatments that are out there? Sure. So Delcat, you know, our goal is to become the leader in targeted, safe, and highly effective minimally invasive treat treatments for patients with cancers of the liver, um, whether or not it's a primary cancer in the liver, um, or a metas or metastatic disease. Um, if you end up with uh, a met in the liver, that's likely what you're going to succumb to. Um, it is a big deal. There are probably about 200,000 patients a year in the U.S. and the EU that get, get diagnosed with metastatic uh, or primary liver disease. There are current local regional treatments, um, but they can't treat the whole liver. Um, they are limited into the frequency of which you can use them, um, and you only can treat what you can see. So there's a need for something uh, better uh, for the cancers in the liver. Um, our first indication is an ultra-orphan one, um, uveal melanoma, metastatic uveal melanoma, cancer that starts in the eye about half the time it metastasizes, and when it does metastasize, um, it's almost always to the liver in a very diffuse, familiarity fashion. Um, this cancer, like many of them, is, is really you can't resect it. Uh, very few patients can actually have the cancer cut out. Um, the product we have is a combination drug device. Um, there's a hepatic delivery system component of it, which creates uh, an extracorporeal circuit um, and a drug component of it. And that's how it's regulated in the U.S., in Europe, it's approved as a standalone device um, uh, under approved under a CE mark. So that's kind of the overall uh, you know, picture of what we're do doing here. We're gonna launch at the very end of this year, the start of next year with commercial product. Uh, we were approved in the US uh, on August 14th. Got it, got it. Um, can you in high level speak about how the Hepzato kit works um, and why it's differentiated? Sure. Um, the concept is derived from a surgical technique um, where many years ago it, people were increasingly using it, but given uh, its morbidity and mortality, uh, it never really took on, it took off. Um, that was called intrahepatic perfusion, where surgeons actually put the liver on uh, a heart lung machine effectively and put very, very high doses of chemo into the liver. 
The rationale behind that was hepatocytes, the working cells of liver, are very robust, very high doses of chemotherapy, um, doses that systemically um, you could never withstand. Uh, so the theory was you'd get much better responses if you could actually um, deliver those, these very high doses uh, without them uh, going systemically. Uh, because this was such an invasive procedure, um, patients were, about 5% of the patients died from the procedure, and it just wasn't feasible for widespread usage. Uh, but the response rates were great in a variety of tumor types. Uh, so a number of surgeons years ago came up with this concept where a double balloon catheter would be inserted in the inferior vena cava, um, access through the femoral uh, vein. And with that double balloon catheter inflated, you could actually block the blood from going systemically as it exited um, the liver. That blood would pass out through that catheter through a filter, and the filter would remove chemotherapy, and then the blood would return back in through uh, the internal jugular in the neck. A second catheter would be placed up through the femoral artery, and that would introduce very, very high doses of melphalan, which is the alkylating agent we use into the liver. So it effectively limits systemic exposure while living very, very high doses of chemo to the liver. It's um, a minimally invasive, repeatable technique, very well tolerated. We've probably done well over a thousand treatments in Europe under a CE mark. Um, and uh, it is all disposable. There's no capital equipment involved with the product. So it's a kit we mail to the, we will ship to the docks in the US with the Melflin. Um, and, uh, you know, patients generally are, uh, leave the hospital after a single night of the procedure. So they'll go in in the morning um, under general anesthesia with an interventional radiology team. The procedure will take place. They'll generally spend one night in the hospital thereafter and go home the following day. Uh, the treatment team in the interventional radiology suite um, is, is comprised around uh, the interventional radiologist, not surprisingly, an anesthesiologist, and a perfusionist. And then they have their support staff as well. Procedure takes about four hours um, from uh, the patient getting wheeled into the uh, procedure room and it being completed. Got it. Um, we all know it's it's difficult and it's gotten more difficult to to get things approved by the FDA. What made it compelling for the body to to give you the approval? You've been up for up the, the company's been up in front of the FDA in years past unsuccessfully. What sort of pushed it properly across the finish line this time? Yeah, so the, I think it's worth um, since you mentioned the prior. Uh, submission, which was uh, about a decade ago, they received the CRL. Um, the product worked from an efficacy perspective. Uh, the problem was there was a fairly significant side effect profile because the filter was not um, he as hemocompatible as it needed to be. Um, and that really only you know came to the fore uh, midway through the trial, the, the, the pivotal phase three trial. Uh, the efficacy was obviously there and very strong response rates, uh, but the trial had a crossover design. And whenever you have a crossover design, if there's a high probability, high percentage of patients crossing over, it confounds any survival uh, analysis. Um, so the trial, the company got the CRL, went back, redesigned the filter. Um, the second trial had very similar, actually slightly better response rates than the first trial and a much, much improved uh, tolerability profile. I think the other thing that helped significantly is it's been on the market for quite a while in Europe. Under a CE mark, and I think as anyone who knows um, you know, the healthcare market well in Europe understands that CE mark is a very low, much lower bar, um, and it doesn't bring reimbursement. The type of data that gets you a CE mark isn't gonna get you reimbursement. These trials, the second phase three will get us reimbursement when it's published in Europe. But over the years, um, again, I mentioned over a thousand treatments have been done in Europe. Um, a lot of publications came out. Um, and I think that real world evidence also helped with the FDA uh, giving us the approval. Um, we do have OS data, it's not in the label, but doctors will look at that. Um, the overall survival is generally much better than other publications. Um, other liver-directed therapies uh, in this disease. Um, 
So I think that's basically what it got, got us over the finish line with the FDA. Got it. Um, let's talk about the economics of the HIPS Auto Kit. Um, can you talk about pricing uh, for the treatment as well as uh, reimbursement from private uh, companies as well as Medicare, Medicaid? Sure, sure. So um, Hepsata will be billed as a drug as a drug with a J code eventually. Initially, it'll be a C code, um, and then we'll get our own permanent J code. Um, Medic, as you know, any physician administered outpatient drug, um, if it's on label, has to be reimbursed by Medicare. Private payers for ultra orphan indications, and this is an ultra orphan indication, about eight hundred patients a year. We think is the TAM. Private payers generally follow whatever Medicare does. Um, so we think we're in good shape there. Um, it is a procedure, but there are existing CPT codes that will cover the multiple steps involved um, for the healthcare providers involved, as well as for the facility. Um, you know, a, a six, the hospital will make about 6% on the drug itself. And I think it'll be a wash relative to other procedures in terms of the amount of time uh, it takes to do the procedure. Now, there was a product approved about a year and change ago in this indication for a subset of metastatic uveal melanoma patients. The product is called uh, Tibentifust um, or Kimtrak from uh, Immunocore. And they're pricing that for about a year's worth of therapy, about a million dollars. Um, Based on the, the mean number of treatments the patients get, it's about $800,000 a patient. We've priced a little more, bit more than about a 5% discount to that, so about $182,500 a treatment. Uh, we expect patients to get a little over four treatments on average, so that's about $750,000 per patient. I know that's a very high price, but again, this is an 800-person TAM. Um, and this is well within the range of other ultra orphan um, drugs. Uh, and again, it will be reimbursed under a J code, which is a pass through uh, from the hospital. Got it. Um, let's talk about uh, adoption. Um, wh what are your expectations in terms of adoptions by doctors and what are you doing in terms of, you know, Salesforce and, and things like that to educate and, and sort of win the, when the hearts and minds here? Yeah, so I think the first thing to, to keep in mind is that um, this will be very much like a device procedure sale um, as well as a drug sale. So there are gonna be a few components of it. The first is we need to train the treating team. So that means training the interventional radiologist, the anesthesiologist, the perfusionist that, that forms the core of the team. So we're gonna to have to, um, under a REMS program, uh, which is the right thing to do, we are going to uh, have to have those that treatment team fly over to another established center and watch the procedure, a preceptorship. And then they will need to then be proctored, have an established team fly out and um, oversee them doing a team, a, a training. So that's really gonna be the, the gating item for um, uptake. Now, I don't think that will restrict eventual penetration, um, but it means that the uptake, you know, will be slower than infused therapy, which you just ship it out to the infusion centers. Now, in terms of, you know, how we're going to approach uh, uh, and, and customer-facing interactions, we're going to have a hospital rep um, that focuses on those treating teams, getting through the VAC or formulary committee. Uh, so he will own that team. We will also have uh, medical oncology reps and their job really is to get the referrals into that treating team. So we'll have two um, kind of two types of reps. Um, we're gonna have four territories in the US um, and I think that'll be adequate to cover what eventually probably will be 25 to 35 um, treating centers. Uh, we expect at peak um, centers to do somewhere between one to perhaps two a week um, initially it'll probably be one a month when we get started. Um, in terms of uptake, um, what we've uh, guided, uh, to investors is by the end of the first quarter, we expect to have at least five centers treating probably at an average of maybe one a month. Um, by the middle of the year, it should be 10 centers. 
um, and somewhere between um, one to two a month. By the end of the year, it should be about 15 centers, probably about two a month on average. And then again, at the end of the following year, somewhere between 25 to 35 really depends on the volume that individual centers are able to do. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, Tibentafus has achieved about 40% penetration into their, their TAM. And their TAM is about 40% of ours, about 300 patients or so, um, given they have a specific mechanism of action that requires a specific HLA allele. Um, I think if we assume that we could reach 40% of the 800 patients, that's about 320 patients. At the price point we're at, that's about the $300 million peak revenue. It'll take you know, a few years to get there, um, but I think that's you know, probably where the company will end up for this particular indication. Um, obviously, we hope to expand beyond this indication, but that's probably you know, what peak revenue will end up being for, for the business at some point for this particular Got indication. Got it. So it's it's a good headway to talking about other indications. Um, investors are really interested in platform companies, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not and so current first indication: uvula melanoma, liver cancer. Talk about where else this could lead to, and you know what are you doing, sort of as a next step here. So what's interesting about this company is there's lots of what I would call signals about efficacy and other indications um, because of A, where it came from. It's a de derivation of this surgery or invasive surgical technique, IHP, as well as all the usage uh, in Europe over the years in a variety of indications. Um, if I start with IHP, which is essentially the same thing we're doing, but in a very invasive manner, there's a fair amount of data in colorectal, neuroendocrine, um, and a whole host of other tumors where you have fairly high response rates. Um, in Europe, we've had um, probably a dozen or more patients done in a whole a variety of indications. Um, breast cancer, I think we've done about eight to 10, and we've seen a number of CRs. Um, CRC, there's been a number of patients done. ICC, there's been quite a few patients done, probably more than two dozen where we've seen decent response rates. There's no reason to think, you know, melting at these types of doses delivered to the whole liver, we will get good response rates. Uh, the real question is, um, for which of those indications do we try to do large multi-center randomized trials? Um, which of those do we do if we go to the other end of the spectrum, fund some modest size IITs in Europe where there's a real appetite to do that? and you know, assume that'll be enough for guidelines um, or perhaps just get re insurance reimbursement for the physicians who believe, you know, have a strong belief that this is appropriate for their patients. Uh, the other place to use this is in combination with amino-oncology agents. Um, the liver, it's well documented that once you have a liver met, amino-oncology agents um, lose much of their efficacy. Uh, the reason for that just has to do with the, the role the liver plays um, in inducing immunotolerance. Um, if you have, uh, the reason the liver does that is because when you eat food, um, antigens get presented to the liver through the portal vein, as well as your microbiome. If the liver didn't do that, we'd all have some type of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the downside of that is anything you get in the liver, hepatitis, for example, or um, uh, metastasis, um, all of a sudden the immune system starts tolerizing it. Uh, we have in combination with our drug, we've seen some pretty profound results in uveal melanoma in a small number of patients. Uh, we have an ongoing IAT we're supporting with uh, just under 80 patients randomized trial uh, that we expect to read out sometime next year. But that'll have profound implications on other areas where IO agents are used. Uh, so we view this as kind of a good background therapy for patients on IO uh, when they end up with liver meds. So between a variety of different indications, CRC, neuroendocrine, breast, ICC, as well as in combination, um, there are a lot of places we can take this product. Got it. Got it. Uh, now I want to just finish up by talking about the balance sheet here. Um, you've been fortunate. You've been able to, in this tight environment, 
um, raise raise some capital uh, with some really good investors. Um, talk about where you're at today, um, what your needs are uh, in the near future. Sure. So um, we ended the second quarter with $15 million in cash, but shortly thereafter, um, we received $35 million in warrant conversions. Um, that was based on a structured uh, financing we had done earlier in the year. Um, we have another tranche of warrants um, that will sunset upon reaching $10 million in quarterly revenue. We anticipate that happening you know, sometime next year. Um, with that available capital, uh, I don't think there'll be any, necess any need for additional equity financings uh, for the business. Uh, just for the listeners, you know, in terms of the share count at the moment, it's 28 million common shares outstanding. Um, I think it makes sense to add the 7.8 million additional tranche A warrants that will uh, likely convert sometime next year for that share count. And then um, there is another 3.6 million warrants outstanding priced at a, a $10 a share as well. Fully diluted share count is about 30 million shares if we include um, stock options and a small amount of convertible debt. Uh, that's outstanding. Got it. Um, Gerard, before we wrap up, anything you want to add? No, I think, you know, as obvious, you know, many companies um, have a severely depressed share price uh, given the overall, you know, macroeconomic environment. Um, I think what's compelling here is, you know, this is an approved FDA product. Uh, it's not going to be too long until we start generating revenue. Um, so, you know, this is not a, you know, a high risk, uh, high risk scenario here. Uh, I think one thing I didn't mention that I think is important is, you know, the commercial team that we're building, they're largely coming from um, companies that, to BTG, that market Y90. So I'm building using a team that's done this before, liver directed therapy, and we're attracting very good people. And, you know, these sales reps do their diligence. So um, that's a fairly, I think, uh, validating factor. Got it. Well, Gerard, thank you for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, again, to anyone out there who's not already signed up for a one-on-one, -on -one, again, please send me an email at shamsian at lithiumpartners.com, S-H-A-M-S-I-A-N at lithiumpartners.com, or visit lithiumpartners.com backslash virtual and click the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. With that, thanks everyone for your time and hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Beth.